Uh, hello everyone, welcome to Aussie Live. Um, I'm here to introduce Josie Rose and Michael Geiser and the e-mentors from CAE. And the session title is called Embedding E in the Community Education Sector. But first of all, what we would like to do is thank our sponsors. Our sponsors are Blackboard Collaborate, CoachCarol.net, the Australia E-Series who are hosting this program, the Learning Revolution Project, Shambles.net, and Cyber Academy. We welcome those sponsors and we thank the Australia E-Series for their work. Now, what we would like to do is just introduce you to Josie Rose and bring her to the microphone. Thank you, Josie. Thank you, Janita. Um, my name is Josie Rose. I work and live in Melbourne and I would um, very much like to know where you are all from. As far as I can gather, most of us are from Australia, but if you want to grab one of the smiley faces and place it on, um, maybe you could put it on a part of the world where you would rather be right now rather than where you actually are, which may be um, even more interesting. And hopefully, Janita, as we go, you can, um, if people come in, give us some idea of where they're from by finding that out for us. That might be quite nice. Some people are wanting to go to Siberia. Um, really different parts of the world. New Zealand is a good one. Um, yeah, I think a nice tropical island would be great for me. So I'm just going to move on. Have we all had a turn? Who wants to be in Siberia somewhere? Or is that maybe even India? Um, we'll find that out later. Hi Mandy, nice to have you with us. Um, we're just about to start, so you've come at a good time. Um, so tonight we want to talk about the e-mental project and we have quite a few of us here. In fact, currently we are um, outnumbered by e-mentals to participants, but hopefully that will change because we've got Android tablets just joining us. And hopefully Android tablets, you can tell us where you're from. We'd love to know if you're from Australia or Victoria or any other part of the world. So I know that Mandy is also from Victoria. I've certainly done quite a bit of work with Mandy. So please put um, something in the text chat so that we know where you're from. Um, this project is very place-based, so it's good to know exactly um, where you're from so that we don't speak about things that may not be um, all that familiar to you. The e-mental project has been going for five years now, and we are working with community providers in Victoria, um, Australia, and later on I'll give you a bit more detail about them. But essentially they are um, adult education providers that work in the post compulsory sector, so with adults, and most of those adults have had a, a, a significant amount of disadvantage. Those are the students that the Learn Local organisations will be working with. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the text chat and Janita and Michael will keep an eye on it. What I would like to do next is just to give you a few minutes to tell me what you think an e-mentor is. You can do that by um, choosing the symbol A, which is to the left of the oops, wrong way around. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see that, to the left of the slide there and um, type in what you think an e-mentor is. I'll give you a few minutes. Um, even the e-mentors can do that. <laughs> we've got a fair few here. We've got um, Janita, uh, Lynn, Ian, Michael, Pam, and um, Coach Carol is not here at the moment, but she was an e-mentor too. So anybody want to type what you think an e-mentor is? Or if you want to grab the microphone and tell us, uh, a support person, supporting the community, that's great. And key individuals to implement strategies. That sounds fabulous. Any other thoughts on the inventory? Oh, Android, can you write us for us in the text chat then? And we will make sure that we get there. Someone will encourage others to develop new skills and knowledge. That would be a mentor, yep, absolutely. What is the E is what I'm interested in. What do you think the E of the E-mentor is, is all about? 
people who assist learn local organizations to set up and implement e-learning in their organizations. Well, that is probably answering my question. <laughs> Uh, oh, Android. Can you write in the chat, the texture? Okay. These are all the definitions that are pretty much spot on. But if you do a search on the web, you will find that e-mentors are often defined as people that use technology to mentor people. So it's often used with young people where they would, for instance, have an adult that works with them online using uh, Skype or email or whatever it might be, mentoring them around a whole range of things. It could be um, career guidance, uh, study support, that kind of um, process. Um, so it's more about the mentoring, using E as the tool or the vehicle to make that happen. Um, yes, it's gently guiding is fabulous. I like that. It's all about the making people ready to look at e-learning as a tool to help them. So thank you, everybody. I think we've got some great definitions there. Um, yeah, I like the gently guiding. Um, somebody in one of the sessions today um, had a lovely phrase, which I will try and find for you, which is very um, technology-infused learning. I think it was Carol, actually. I really like that. It's part of that gently guiding. So moving on, I'm just having to give Michael some time to. So for us, e-mentoring has been all about providing mentoring support, so face-to-face -face support, but also doing that in the context of e-learning. So we've got people who are incredibly um, technologically proficient, have been working in e-learning for a long time, know the community education sector really well, and go into that organization and work with them as a mentor using technology, but also to talking to them about technology, which tools are going to help them to solve specific problems or meet particular challenges. And um, Carol also called them network nomads, tech stewards, wisdom warriors, and technology-infused learning, which I thought was really great. So um, these are the types of things that e-mentors do. Highly skilled, highly knowledgeable professions that work in a very, very small organization. Some of them have an annual turnover of about 100,000, and many of them have a turnover of a few million a year. So there's a huge range in, in, in who we work with and how we therefore work with them. So in, Essentially, our e-mentors, and I'll explain to you in a few minutes who they are and how it works, are what I would call agents of change. We know that it takes um, at least three years for um, any major change to uh, really grab hold in an organization. The types of organizations we work with, I think, probably takes longer. Um, our e-mentors are crucially important because they work with self-identified individuals in small organizations and they help them to take e-learning from the margins into the mainstream in their organization. Um, they work with hopefully managers and often they are managers who are involved but very often they are also teachers. So what we do is we put out expressions of interest across the learn local sector um, in Victoria and we get people to self-select. In the main, we work with people who want to find out more about e-learning and how it can help their very, very small organizations. So you're sitting there thinking, well, who are they? Um, Janita and definitely um, Maggie will recognize this picture. They are neighborhood houses and community centers. There are uh, currently, we've worked with 178 of them over the past five years. Many of them have been involved for up to three years. And during that time, the government has spent about $800,000 on this program. The bulk of the money goes towards the e-mentors and the e-champions and um, some for the administration of the project. As I said before, we put out an expression of interest through the funding body, 
people apply online, we meet and then discuss how are we going to look after particular applicants. Uh, I actually have a project yeah. it's, really, it's not a particularly well-funded project, I agree. Considering that though, we've done a, a tremendous amount of really great work in those five years. So we sit down, we look at the geographical boundaries and we work out who is best placed to support this organisation. Also looking at the tools that they want to work with, uh, we get them to nominate some tools that they're interested in, we get them to, to tell us where they're at in their e-learning journey. So these um, local organisations are, um, if you are, we've got a little picture here of Australia. Um, Victoria sits within that and that actually, as you can see, Mandy and Janita comes from a website, sailcommunity.com, which is a really great website. <laughs> Um, and this very much older picture you will all recognize and love for um, it is still, still essentially the way that we have until last year operated. So we have eight regions in um, Victoria and our e and e-champions work across those eight regions. So just because we have to have a bit of statistical information, I had a look at the annual report for the ACFI board last year. And they, in fact, uh, the Learn Locals right across these eight regions delivered um, to 111,000 learners across the state. There are 330 Learn Locals that can, in fact, if they want to access um, our services. Fortunately, not all of them do at the same time. Um, and they specialize in providing a welcoming, informal, and adult focused approach to learning. They are all community owned and managed, which is um, one of the things that very often your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. Uh, many small organizations would work with community based management committees who don't necessarily know or understand e-learning or what it can bring to their organization. So that's where the change management process comes in and our e-mentors and e-champions um, support them in, in making choices and decisions to help them with that. Um, there are a significant amount of student contact hours that, that um, go to learn locals every year. Last year was 1.8 million student contact hours of pre-accredited training only. Pre-accredited training is training that students would um, access before they go into a more formalized learning environment if they so choose. Um, there they learn um, things like return to study, they improve their literacy numeracy skills, um, and they broaden their employment options in that way. So it's like initial vocational training or it gives them a pathway to vocational training. Of all the learners that um, are e-mentor, well not the e-mentors, the e-leaders, who are the people that the e-mentors would work with, work with 59% of those learners are 45 years and older, so it's quite an interesting demographic. 82% across of Victoria are born overseas, and 56% of them have not completed year 12. So it's quite a specific demographic. In fact, the next slide gives you a much clearer picture of who the learners are that we are looking at eventually benefiting from our e-mentoring interventions as we support the teachers to find ways of making educational delivery for them more accessible, more interesting, um, and provide the organizations with ways of making their businesses more sustainable. So this particular graph, and if you have any questions, you just put up your hand or pop something in the text chat. Um, correct, Michael, very true. The ones in the, in the dark blue, um, you can see they all have a little star. That indicates that the percentage of these learners is greater than the percentage of the state's adult population for that characteristic. So we have an unusually high number of unemployed individuals that come to learn locals. We also have an unusually high group of early school leavers that come to learn local organizations. 
and as well as the um, culturally and linguistically diverse. So for us, I suppose, as e-mentors and e-champions, this is important information because it shows who our target audience is. Although we work with teachers and managers, they are looking for solutions to better support our students there. So um, very, very interesting annual report, in fact, and well worth having a look at. So how does our model work? Essentially what we're trying to do is build capacity in our own local organisations. And um, mine, yes we do, Janita, I agree with you. My little model here is quite simplistic, but hopefully uh, for, I think for our current audience you will understand where I'm coming from with this. The learned local organisations on the left hand side of my little pyramid is really the capstone, the rock of what we do. They are the ones that say to us, look, we're interested, we want you to come and talk to us, we have these challenges, how can technology help us? We have eight e-mentors um, who are um, at the totally at the centre of what we do and they are very ably supported by 10 e-champions. So we have a capacity building model. Within the local organisation, we work with an individual who will work with an e-champion and the e-champion will be overseen by the e-mentor and they work as a, as a little group. Very often the person in the land local organisation um, has a real passion for technology and they then become an e-champion. And very often an e-champion will become an e-mentor, so we're building capacity that way. Um, digital capacity within individuals and within organisations. And at the top, as we noticed earlier, uh, such a funding body, and we're very really grateful, obviously, for the funding we get, but it's, it's not a huge budget. And my role in that is just to make sure it all happens and that everybody um, is able to do what they need to do when they need to do it. So the Learn Local Organisation, the e-mentors and the e-champions are really the, the um, foundations of this project and what a foundation it is. I found this um, in a blog when I did some research on it and I really like this particular um, graphic. It's actually from a um, capacity building model for international NGOs and I thought that that was um, a very useful way for us to look at what we do. It's the four A's of capacity building. Um, at the basis of all of this, um, hi Lucien, if you can pop in the text chat and tell us where you're from, we'd love to know where you're from. Um, the audience is absolutely crucial in this. For us the audience would be um, our learners and, and we know who they are and our teachers. And whatever e-learning solution we as e-mentors and e champions suggest to any organisation has to be scaled, scalable, I suppose, for a particular group uh, at a particular time. The next one is, and I'm sure uh, hopefully soon you will be able to talk to people like Pam and Lynn and Michael and talk to them about what they actually do um, at the call phase. The solutions have to be appropriate. So can we contextualise for our very high needs learners? Oh, hi, you're from Romania. Wow, that's very far away. Welcome. Hopefully you can catch up with what we're talking about. We're talking about um, using um, mentoring um, to work with very small community-based um, organisations um, in, the, in the community sector. So I'll um, just ask if you've got any questions. We want whatever, whatever e-learning solution we provide to these small organisations to be appropriate as I said so they can contextualise it for their uh, organisation. There's no point in suggesting a giant Moodle setup when it's just not something that they have the technology for. Um, it's got to be, yet again, really closely tied to appropriate if accessible. The resources that we uh, suggest to them, the resources that they're interested in, uh, it's got to be accessible for the staff and for the students, easily accessible. As you will see in a minute, one of our biggest challenges is the, face of the fact that um, people in the low local sector still don't have good technology. 
And then it's got to be affordable and preferably free. And I think as a group, we've been really good at finding really fabulous, cheap solutions to, um, to challenges where technology can, in fact, make a difference. So I think as a model for um, non-government non organisations, it is one that we, in fact, can certainly look at as a model to um, explain what we do and how we do it. This model is one that's come out of the research, um, and the researcher um, looked at our five years of operation and came up with, um, with this particular model. She says that within any local organization, you either get the investment model, where the organization is really keen and uh, is goes ahead leaps and bounds, or you get the deficit model, which is one that isn't particularly sustainable. Where it's one person's interest, if that person goes, everything falls by the wayside. Most of the time we find that there is a, a progression in how people uh, interact with us and what they require us to do. In the first um, session, most of our e-mental um, our projects are six months, sometimes we're lucky in advance for 12 months, so there's not a little lot we can do in six months. So if they're brand new, hi Paul, if they're brand new, then it's all about awareness raising, just explaining to them what it is and how it works, but uh, Michael and some of the other e-mentors will be able to give you more information on what they do. They move into evaluating some tools and then look at how they might be able to use them, and this is where Sort of around application and evaluation is where they start looking at a, a business plan. Um, just a simple one, some a mentoring agreement so we can get some structure in place in terms of how they do that. And then eventually, after three years, um, they may well be on their way and very much into embedding e-learning within the organization. Um, on the left here, the researchers thought that there was um, a bit of a correlation between the level of support, between awareness raising and less support with embedding. But I think if you talk to Pam and Michael who are here today, they may not agree with you. Because as we get higher up the embedding tree, people are actually quite demanding in what they want in terms of instructional design and Moodle skills, which are quite high order skills. So um, yeah, so that, this is the model that we're currently working with. This, this is really quite a unique program. It's not really been tried and tested anywhere else. So um, we, we kind of backpedaling in terms of getting our research and our theory organized. So I'll be getting there. So based on this model, what have some of our crimes been? And I realized later that probably an unfortunate word in as much as, um, well, I think times for us is achievements and successes. And I'm sure that any of the e-managers that are currently sitting here will be looking at these and, and nodding. Um, the face-to-face -face visits are incredibly important. We go to the organization, speak to the teachers, meet the learners, look at what they're doing. We have an agreement with them. We work in very small groups uh, with the teachers and the managers. Where they are, the e mentors and the e champions are, are very much on call for the time of the project, be it six months um, or 12 months. They choose which tools to focus on. It's very hands on. They get everybody together face to face. So there's a lot of face to face, as you can see. And there's also some online. What I think we have done particularly well as a, as a group of e mentors and e champions is that we have an incredibly cohesive, knowledgeable, supportive, and dedicated team of 18 e-mentors and e-champions, which is quite an achievement. We've had very little turnover in the past five years in terms of people. Uh, everybody um, supports each other really well. It's a very, very strong statewide network. Um, and that together we've worked on this model, and it's now been growing for five years with 178 organizations later. So um, I think for those 178 organizations that currently uh, are act actively engaging in some form of e-learning or e-business, it's been um, a really valuable experience. I'm currently doing an independent survey to get some um, idea back from the actual recipients, how they're going. 
and um, it, it's looking um, very positive. I haven't got all the results in yet, um, but the feedback has been really quite um, phenomenal. And the one thing we're obviously trying to do is to support um, organizational sustainability. I mean, this is where a business case comes in for e-learning. Why are people doing it? Um, and some of these reasons are um, to be a more sustainable a registered training organization, to provide more um, information to the, or access to education for their students, and to find some really good technology can help their low-level students. Um, tyranny of distance in Australia and even in Victoria is quite significant. And um, young people are demanding it. Um, so, Paul, um, I agree with you, Paul. This and, and this program actually, um, to to some degree, proves that in terms of there is enormous potential. I think what we are facing, though, is some of the challenges. Um, I don't know what your background is. Be great to hear from you. We have organizations um, where people are time poor and they're not getting paid for a lot of what they do. They don't have the time or often the committee doesn't have the inclination to look at a business plan, particularly for e-learning. When somebody leaves, everything goes with them and often that is everything. So there's nobody left who can pick up the um, baton and move on. Um, for many of those organizations, it's still nice to have for a very low priority. And particularly um, the IT infrastructure that some of them are dealing with is, is quite something. Um, and low skills, like low staff, staff skills, but we're working on that and that's what we're there for as e-mentors to actually work with them on that. And as I said at the beginning, it's a three-year process. So um, if it gets interrupted, there's often um, more, more time is needed to kind of bring things together again. But I'm going to hand over to Michael now because Michael, together with his colleagues who are here, Lynn and Janita and um, Pam, will be able to talk to you more about what they actually do at the, at the grassroots level because um, they are the ones who are making this program thing. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Michael, and I think Janita will do questions at the end. Is that correct? If I can do that, no problem. Thank you very much. I think for that um, magnificent overview of the uh, program's um, direction. And uh, very, this is very cool, uh, Pam. I'll take, uh, take that as a question on notice. Um, in terms of the mentoring project and how it worked on the ground, just, uh, every uh, mentor probably approached this a little bit differently, but. Um, the post we took was to kind of look at visits to a couple of visits to the providers. It's a bit hard to organise much more than that given the duration of the program generally and also the fact that many of the people who were working with within the organisation are part time uh, and incredibly busy and uh, out of a stretch and getting them uh, out of that sort of environment to kind of think freely about areas that they're not 100% comfortable is always quite good, so it's quite difficult. So that first visit often was to kind of just um, free the mind a little bit and uh, explore some options and to look at what the strengths were of the organisation in terms of learning and teaching as sometimes as, as well as potential uh, skills in the organisation or that, that something didn't always gel with, with how the opportunities um, were. And then trying to with some sort of plan. So this is the sort of the difficult one, I think, because you were trying to explore some options based on what they want to do from a sort of a business opportunity perspective, based mainly on their clients, uh, and come up with, with, with a way that technology could be part of that and how they might come to and understand the technology and then understand how that knowledge could be applied to uh, working with their with their trainers and also with um, their clients and potentially even their, their, their community members. The second thing was really was really rolling up the sleeves and um, attempting to get on with the business of, of implementing their particular project that they that they had come up with. Um, so in terms of like our approach in our particular region, for the six months we looked at 
two site visits to the provider. There were four online sessions with them if required, and sometimes these translated into face-to-face -face visits if we had um, some time for some reason. And then uh, statewide network activities, where the kind of a gang, the network of mentors would uh, offer um, webinar skill sessions uh, around e-learning e tools and practices from a practical perspective into their region and by default that became available to the rest of the state um, to participate in. One of the sort of challenges for a lot of us is that um, the learning local sector is, has gradually kind of been left from a funded perspective with um, pre-vocational uh, educational preparatory compensatory style programs is the sort of uh, area that we were to work in. Uh, a lot of the larger learning locals are in the kind of vocational sector. So when we look at sort of e-learning on a continuum of adult education, then there are a whole range of different possibilities that are available in terms of blending learning to encompass uh, not only online, modes, um, but also the traditional face-to-face -face methodologies. You know, maybe some self-paced content that um, focuses on uh, knowledge, and then maybe some form of online facilitated activity, which is a, generally kind of a, a way of teasing out the learner's story, the learner's kind of way of being able to express how they've taken on board the skills and knowledge learned in, in these particular here in these particular areas. And in the local kind of sector, it's a little bit tough because the majority of uh, participants is shown by Josie's table, um, you know, are pretty disadvantaged and often access to technology uh, is difficult for them. That's not to say it's not, it's not there, um, but certainly people tend to be coming off a bit of a lower skill base. So looking at ways that we can in infiltrate some of these technologies into the face-to-face -face situation, particularly too, given that uh, you know the learning locals are not essentially really funded for anything else beyond the face-to-face -face class, tends to become the main objective um, for our organisations, except where um, they may have got some additional capacity funding for some projects. And quite often, and hello, Katrina, welcome, welcome along. Uh, quite often, that was the case. There was some ancillary funding which gave Learn Locals a, a, a bit more cash to sort of look at projects in a bit more meaty way. So in terms of kind of communicating, and this might, might sort of fit into your point that you made, Paul, about sort of um, uh, not-for-profit organisations and building capacity, that try and have a sort of central hub that was kind of simple to operate and that pushed um, information to participants so they haven't to necessarily log on all the time. Um, where we could kind of store information. We used, um, uh, in, in our region, we used Yama, but every region was, was different. And state level, there was a, an overall um, portal using uh, Ning to kind of keep uh, the momentum going sort of statewide and share things along. Uh, the mentor group as a whole came up with uh, a series of kind of um, commitments to try and sort of formalise and uh, reinforce the seriousness of the program that providers had put their hand up for. There's sometimes a tendency for organisations to have a feeling that they need to be part of new initiatives just to sort of stay current or with the potential for funding. So we had to take a step back from the word go to kind of um, reinforce um, a few things about how what their involvement would sort of be based upon and the relationship side of it, so that it was that was kind of clear, and then from the point of view of the mentor, what the, what what their responsibilities would be in sort of supporting the the mentee uh, along the way. Uh, and at first, visit, we easily tried to put together some kind of um, plan based on the discussions that we had, and the plan came from. Um, several suggestions from the men mentors, uh, which we tried, uh, which tried to sort of take a bit of a big picture look at what the organisation was aiming to do, so that we we're all on the kind of same page, and whether there were any other kind of opportunities that might float up. And this was a really interesting thing because 
Sometimes when we go to start talking to providers, their main project focus was uh, some classroom activity that they wanted to um, re-inject uh, some interest into by using learning technologies. But on speaking, we realised that you know the providers had committee members that were far flung, um, staff that were casualised, and so they weren't um, in contact with one another. So frequently, and we start to see other opportunities for using. Um, uh, a community of practice style tools to help um, manage the, the program. So lots of things kind of floated up from, from that um, discussion. That's very true, lots of um, mentor mentor engagement. So here's just a couple of, um, and certainly every mentor you would you would talk to them, there's quite a few here, and we'll probably hear from them soon, uh, would be able to kind of provide you with some. Um, magnificent examples of where this project went, but in this example here from this community centre, their interest was essentially um, to run a staff wiki to keep people in the loop with things that were happening and to keep them um, understanding the compliance issues that they had, news, funding programs, and they were quite active in their community and had a lot of events. So they, they just sort of kept that sense of team that was hard to gather. Um, because people were casualised on different days through using that wiki. Now this mob also were very committed to um, addressing uh, opportunities for youth in their disadvantaged areas so that they could participate in funky arts-based multimedia things. So they're forever running kind of entry level uh, filmmaking courses, um, sound mixing, um, digital photography type things, um, not purely and simply as a way of learning technology, but primarily as a way of, of giving them opportunity to express themselves and to um, contribute to the definition uh, of their community by having their, their voice heard, and they're, they're wonderful, these guys, are getting that. Um, some of our providers are quite entrepreneurial as well, and this particular group here, um, and you'll be forgiven for thinking they're slightly frightening, uh, have been working on how to translate some fantastic literacy resources they write for skill shortage areas in um, key trades um, into an e-learning uh, format so that they could uh, uh, make them available um, beyond being in such a sort of a hard copy kind of format. Uh, but many of our uh, providers that we work with are often taking very tentative steps in in applying blended learning, and we're quite fortunate the mentor program ended up being a bit of a vortex for other state government initiatives that, because of our expertise and our reach into the sector, we were able to um, piggyback off those initiatives and hit the ground running with providers probably much quicker than if we're starting from scratch. And I mentioned two projects of which a few people in here were part of. One was um, using Microsoft Link and a trial for um, not only working with learners but also staying in touch with one another and networking across the, the state. And the uh, links of the uh, Intel Digital Literacy Program, which was um, really welcomed by a lot of people in the sector as a way of um, well, a prepackaged program that people could pick off the shelf and hit the ground running uh, without having to reinvent the wheel around basic uh, digital literacy skills, word processing, um, PowerPoint, um, internet, and a whole range of sort of project kind of things as well. Um, one of our other providers was really keen, I thought this was a really interesting thing, might fit into your kind of thing, Paul, around looking at live community events. So their community coastal, small coastal community, a lot of change going on and uh, quite a lot of uh, impact on uh, the way that the town had sort of organised itself with new developments and uh, roads and um, demands on the resources in, in their harbour. And so they were very keen to kind of have community meetings which they run uh, at their centre around particular issues. and. Um, to then take a unified voice to council or VCAT or whatever it may be. So these guys were very keen to broaden the opportunity for people to participate in these meetings that couldn't make it by um, pushing out the live, the events live through some form of, of learning technology. 
I'll just sort of wind up by just quickly kind of going through a couple of tricks that mentors have, have really got to take on if they're, they're going, to, going to be. And, and you know, dancing with a dog is the kind of thing that you, you'd probably only do if you, if you had a few thunderbirds in you, but it's an absolute metaphor for um, what a mentor has to sort of put front and centre to their, their mind is understanding the culture and of the organisation they are working with so that you can um, adapt yourself to think in a way that they do and see the world through through their eyes to be able to kind of identify the uh, opportunities. And from that that really means you have to really kind of work on well, what are the strengths of the organisation to begin with and that's where we should start. Introducing e-learning technologies is always tough if you're coming off a low base. And to start with something new means you've got, you're sort of at a double disadvantage. So often we try to tease out, well, what are your strengths? What do you do really well with your students? What do you do well with your community? What do you do well with your community? And then how might that be enhanced or broadened um, or have opportunities for a new audience or to keep the conversation going if we were to move into that, that sort of space? It often means that the ideas might be there, but there's often kind of resistance um, and people are often, there is still pockets of people being um, scared or just not interested in, in and that can often drag um, an organisation down where there are individuals who are. So we often have to confront um, those attitudes and, and depict possible futures. Um, for the good of the community to get them to get them on board, and that's that's probably the biggest challenge I think when you do move into an organisation that has um, resistance. And I guess part of the ongoing role of the mentor is to not open people's eyes, I guess, but just um, give them a bit of a glimpse into another world and draw them in to identify um, people, networks. Um, experiences, resources and ideas that can help them take a lesson from uh, from their experiences for adaption and applying um, to their particular situation. <clears throat> Probably one of the, goes to that saying too for the, the mentors as well and, and this is where there's a strong collegiate element to good mentoring program is um, is staying current and staying um, uh, in touch with where thinking is in a whole range of different pockets with uh, learning technology. So this conference is a um, good metaphor for that in the sense that it has presentations coming from preschool, school, um, the adult communication sector, higher education, vocational education um, and corporate education training. All those have kind of different ways of seeing what's often the same the same thing. So unpacking and realising where the thought's going and, and reinforcing one another's pedagogical base to these new ideas is a really important um, component of staying grounded and ensuring that what we do uh, is sensible and applies to those um, strengths that we identify in the community. And look, sometimes I think it's just important for organisations to just dive in and have a go. I mean, you can do all the planning in the world, and sometimes you can, what you can do is plan to fail and plan to give yourself an out. Where sometimes, if you're keen and can see a kernel of an idea, and you've got a little bit of faith in yourself to be um, to to work through it as you go, then diving in is is sometimes a uh, it's not for everybody, but for those who, who want to give it a go, I think it's important for us to, to, to support them um, along the way. And it's very important to celebrate your wins. And for those of you not from um, Victoria, this is me in celebrating a um, number of premierships from my favourite football side here in um, Hawthorne. And um, this is probably what I'll be buried in, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen. Right here, but it is really important. Our sector is so busy, so stressed, so time um, dependent that we don't often get time to just kind of celebrate something that's happened that's really, really fantastic. And it's really, really important to do that. And I think our sector's getting quite good at it. Um, to just take time out of the, the hurly burly and say, okay, well, we, we really did nail that. Um, and 
and formalised the, the celebration as a, as a milestone and footy, that's right. Well, that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll hand back over to uh, Janita, who I think we're going to have some time for questions and um, contributions from the rest of you. So thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse and Michael. Uh, I wonder if people would like to come to the microphone and maybe some of the mentors could come to the microphone as well and, and take over and just tell them a little bit about what they've experienced as well uh, over the last few years as me mentor. And, and Paul and everyone, if you'd like to ask any questions, please put your hand up now. Now's the perfect time to do it. No takers? Okay, then well, I think if there's no one um, going to have a bit of a chat and come to the microphone, we can um, call this session over and say thank you very much uh, to the mentors and thank you Josie and Michael for taking us on this journey. Now one of the things we do want to offer you is that, uh, I'll just go to the end of the slide, I'm just going to find that there's some badges there for you. We'll just go and have a look at the other find them. Must be the last slide. No, it might be at the top. I'm just finding the slide. Here we go. I think it's this one. This one. Oh, no. We do have some nice little... Uh, Badges here, but I can't quite find them at the moment. This slide it must be down the bottom here. I'm looking for, oh, there they are. Thank you, someone did that for me. <laughs> and look, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's uh, wonderful. Please go and collect your badges, and we will be putting this uh, recording up into the Ming for others to have a listen to. Thank you very much for your time, Josie, and also Michael, and then the e mentors. Thank you very much. Hi, Thanks thank everybody you. for coming and all the emails do for your support. Hopefully we'll have some good news for you soon. Have a good night. Thanks Katrina.